everyone. We're back with another episode with me, Saman, on Off the Record. And here uh, we'll discuss another episode, another university, another student, and obviously different levels of experiences. And uh, I'm really glad that I am, you know, catching up on a lot of colleges on the same side of the belt. Uh, we've done, uh, you know, the Baltimore County uh, University. We've done George Washington University. And now we head on to the Johns Hopkins University. So here we have Arpit and uh, he would be talking us through a lot of different things, how he got in, through the uh, university, how his experience was. And now he's working with Pearson. Uh, his job experience, the current role and how it aligns. We'll talk a lot about those things. So uh, first of all, uh, I really want to thank you, Arpit, for joining us and sharing your experience with everyone uh, on Off the Record on ITSP Magazine. So I'd like to give you a moment to introduce yourself. Uh, when did you come to the United States from where? And yeah. yeah. Uh, well, firstly, thank you for having me on this podcast. Uh, yeah, so I'm originally from Mumbai. Uh, I came to the US in fall of 22, uh, a little bit after, after the COVID thing had settled down. I pursued my master's of science in security informatics or cybersecurity from Johns Hopkins. And yeah, I have, uh, I graduated last year in December. And since then I have been working as an application security engineer at Pearson. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's been a journey and I'm excited to talk about it here. I really love to uh, know more about like, you know, uh, working with Pearson obviously offline but uh, I've always heard like because I've sat for a couple of certifications and Pearson view was you know the topmost priority to you know go through and you know use their platform so I would really love to talk more about it and obviously a little later in the podcast as well with you but uh, starting up with Arpit like uh, you graduated very recently it's been like 10 months working yeah. But if we go back in time and when you were actually planning up to come to the United States, um, what was your criteria of choosing? Obviously, we know Johns Hopkins is a very elite university. Nobody would say no to it. But uh, as students, we always have a bunch of options from where we select and see, OK, uh, the city may be a preference or the tuition fees or the scholarship. So let's just talk about the college. What stood out for you? Uh, for the college that you chose it uh, yeah sure uh, so firstly before even selecting the college for me a um, major decision point was whether to go with an ms in cyber security and put all my eggs in that basket or whether i should go with just an ms in computer science and then explore uh, luckily for me by that time i had been working in the industry for a while and I had kind of realized that cyber security is where I wanted to have my career. Um, so that's why in the application process, uh, I mostly focused on uh, applying to cyber security programs. There were a few universities where I also applied for their CS programs, uh, but my focus was always cyber security. Um, and coming to your original question about Johns Hopkins, uh, for me, the major criteria, the reason why I selected Johns Hopkins was one, uh, I was personally, I was interested in doing research in space tech, in space cybersecurity. And I found a professor at Hopkins, Professor Gregory Falco. He, he's, I think, in uh, Princeton right now, if I'm not sure, but he used to work here. And uh, I had a word with him and he offered me to join his lab uh, in uh, attacking satellites, basically, if I was given in, uh, if I was given an admission to Hopkins. So I wanted to work on that part. So that was, I would say, a major deciding factor for me. Apart from that, I was also like the brand name of Hopkins was definitely a factor. And also there was this thing where, uh, so I was, I had also received admits from a few other universities, but the batch size there was really huge. 
like the batch size was i think 400 or 500 people compared to hopkins where our batch size was only 60 so uh, for me personally that was another plus uh, because it uh, it felt like there were more opportunities that that i could utilize uh, and yeah those those i think were the major factors and uh, looking back now uh, i definitely feel like i did make the right choice with that Totally, you did. Like, no going wrong with uh, such, like, benefits that you actually talked about. And I guess it's just limited. There would be more that you would mm -hmm. have, you know, gone through all through your session time. So it's like the curriculum uh, for uh, the cybersecurity program at Hopkins. I'll just say it, Hopkins, so that it's quicker. So, um, and there's, like, a funny story behind it as well. I guess there should be one KT session uh, we have at the end of the program where, you know, you tell your college's correct pronunciation. Maybe a lot of us may get it wrong, but why not be this a teaching session as well? So we can take that yes. at the end uh, yeah. of the podcast. But uh, coming back to the point, like, uh, obviously, Hopkins stood out for a lot of different pointers, uh, because of the research program and a lot of other things that it really excels on. Uh, how did the curriculum stood out for you as compared to obviously the other college admits that you had? What stood out in that curriculum, like generally, which really wanted you to go for that course and not for the other ones? Sure. Uh, so when you just look at the curriculum uh, uh, at its face value, I did find that the curriculum was pretty similar to other universities. But when you actually go and talk to your seniors, uh, you will realize that there are certain differences. So basically, everything at Hopkins, uh, you would see it is more academia focused or research focused. Uh, by that, what I mean is if you're learning something here, uh, or if you have a professor, then it would be very easy for you to expand upon the subject if you want to do some research in that. Hopkins, obviously, uh, it, it's known for its medical field, like uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital is one of the best uh, in the world. And uh, the medical institutes, uh, the colleges are also uh, also great. So that you will see here in every aspect. Uh, so if if you are someone who's interested in medical device security or anything to do with medicine, then yeah, Hopkins is a great choice. Now, personally, for me, uh, apart from medicine, for me personally, space sector was something which was very exciting. And Hopkins does have a lot of that uh, uh, like the James Webb Space Telescope, it's operated right from Hopkins itself. Uh, uh, there is the Space Telescope Science Institute. So there's a lot of things going around space. So uh, there were subjects in the curriculum which were specific for space sector uh, that I was attracted towards. And apart from that, uh, Hopkins does have some world-class professors like uh, the professors like Matt Green who are very well renowned in the cryptography and blockchain space. Uh, so all the subjects that we had, uh, they were great. They were taught by faculties who were both in the industry as well as there were people who were deeply into researching uh, exciting new ways of utilizing these uh, so the professors were a big factor for me in in selecting the university uh, when talking about the curriculum some things that attracted me were one we had uh, I think now this is going to be something which is pretty similar for other universities as well this is more of a general thing but the way I tried to design my curriculum was I tried to keep a balance of different technologies, different uh, aspects of cybersecurity. So for example, I took some courses which were more policy and management oriented uh, when talking about in context of security. Uh, there were some courses which were around ethical hacking and, uh, and web security 
Uh, I had taken a few, uh, I had taken a cryptography course. I had taken a few courses on forensics. I had taken a few courses on reverse engineering, on network security. Uh, so those things just gave me a good breadth of everything that security had to offer. Uh, and that helped me kind of both be a jack of all trades as well as understand what was it that I actually liked and then go deeper into that. So uh, if I had to give an advice, that's something I would go, uh, give to anyone else who is uh, also thinking about uh, maybe just cybersecurity or even computer science in general, is to unless you definitely know that you are looking at the specific field, try to keep your options open. Yeah, I was about to say like jack of all trades because, you know, a lot of people actually come up and say, you know, what domain should we go for? Because obviously cybersecurity is pretty huge in terms of areas and what are the different things that one could learn and excel or like. Uh, but this is really good. Like if you're paying so much tuition fees, it's better that you explore all of the areas and see for yourself like what works for you once you're out in the professional world. So I would say that's like a really smart decision. And of course, Hopkins providing you with that curriculum where you yeah. have exposure to everything, like little bit, little bit. And then you can actually understand uh, that, okay, this is this, this happens here and, you know, that could actually that would have helped you a lot with with choosing of choosing what area you want to go into eventually right yeah uh, like uh, like i mentioned some of this was also due to the design of the course itself like we were uh, required to take two uh, i think yeah we were required to take three courses so i was in the technology and research track and in this we were required to take three courses had to be around policy and management. Uh, so just knowing that you had to take those made it easier to select those. Otherwise, uh, the technical courses themselves were so exciting that uh, if it was up to me, I would have probably dropped one of the non-technical courses in favor of yeah. the technical one. But they just keep again, it like to yeah. balance the, you know, the load because if you take yeah. a lot of technical, it would be a little difficult. So they try to balance it with non-tech like it happened with my university as well. Definitely. And uh, by being in the industry, uh, definitely having those non-tech subjects was also were definitely really helpful. Things like just writing up incident response plans or uh knowing about privacy laws mm -hmm. uh things of that nature uh were really are really helpful now I when agree. working in my job there was one subject with my university like in the curriculum it was on disaster management mm -hmm. and we used to actually write like bcp like for you know any private sector like there were uh you know certain cases where our professors used to you know call up the friends and you know uh give us like certain sections of their private sector uh you know product and we used to do like the 360 degree analysis and then we used to write a report okay this is missing uh we would recommend this to be done and you know there's no like there were you know institutions where dr plans were not there so mm -hmm. you know it's difficult you know to cope up with such places where you have your database just across a tropical place and you don't know anything can happen. So those were good situations where I actually wrote like DR plans for a government agency. And uh, it was fun like to, you know, hypothetically think of situations and write it and just to understand what actually happens when BCP occurs or, you know, disaster occurs. Right. Even for me, so it, it's not just hypothetical. Uh, so we had a similar subject of uh, cybersecurity risk management, CRM, uh, where we had the same thing. Uh, we were supposed to write a HIPAA audit report for a medical institution. And the way we went about doing that, so just uh, doing like an architecture of the entire hospital uh, network, uh, who all the stakeholders were, what's the important data, how it's being secured, backups, right till the point of writing a final report and then presenting it in front of the class. 
uh, that exact thing. So earlier, before coming to the US, I used to work at EY for a while. And the exact thing that we did in CRM across our semester was the same thing that we actually did with uh, with one of our clients, one of our Fortune 500 clients. So just seeing how accurate it was in its portrayal of what you do in the industry uh, was really good. Like if, if you're someone who is interested in those kind of things about uh, audits or like you mentioned, disaster recovery plans, uh, writing those up, building those out, then taking such courses would really be helpful. I agree. There's like one more uh, subject that I had. Like these subjects I really liked because they were not more of theoretical portions, but they were like what you learned is what you actually practically apply. So there was a course, I just can't remember its name, but it was more of... um where you know you're divided into teams obviously and then you choose one uh product or maybe one uh you know uh anything that's operating currently and you know build up the architecture for it if you are building for it right. and then see uh, what model they are actually following and how safeguard their data is and how they're actually processing all those things so i do remember uh we had different situations, but my team actually chose, there's like a grocery run app back in India that's called Blinkit. Uh, mm -hmm. if anyone not knows, so Blinkit has this thing that, you know, we deliver everything in 30 minutes, like anything with there in, you know, uh, 30 minutes or maybe lesser, I guess. I don't remember it now. It's way past one year. So we did like the complete analysis of what actually, how it's actually, you know, built up and then what all things we can incorporate, you know, magnify those features better so these activities actually play really a role here where you actually understand things and then you get out in the world and apply it and that's what i guess the curriculum for you also provided right right uh not exactly the same but we had a similar subject called sva which was software vulnerability analysis mm -hmm. uh which i felt was really cool uh so some parts of it was similar to what you said where we took an existing application and then uh, kind of understood how its architecture worked. Uh, we took open source applications, so uh, it helped having the access to the code to see how it worked. But moving further into the course, we actually kind of like reverse engineered those retro games that we had in consoles like the Mitashi consoles and things like that. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, we reverse engineered those games, exploited vulnerabilities in them, mm -hmm. hacked them. Uh, so that course was both extremely fun and very technical. Like I've learned more in that one course in three months than I had in like Hell three really. months before and that. I still remember... Um... In my first semester, like the first fall semester, I had a subject where, you know, we were given like a safe, closed environment and we had to perform multiple attacks in that environment limited to the data we have. Right. And that was by far the best. Like you do those attacks and then as part of getting the grades, you have to replicate the same attack in the class on a presentation mode in front of your professor and you do those attacks or, you know, day one, you had to do those password attacks. So, you know, how mm -hmm. to generate those passwords. So that was really amazing for me to know, like it's cracking the password from day one of my fall mm -hmm. semester and it cracked it at the end of the fall semester. So, you know, that was technically our assignments to, you know, mm -hmm. do and submit it and maybe like extra credit or anything of that sort. But those were the instances where everyone actually understand, okay, this is security onion. This is how things work up here. And, you know, when we talk about things like client server, you know, there actually you understand better who is who and what are we actually doing it. So those were the sections like how you know the curriculum really helps you like it's just not understanding okay uh this is ddos attack and you know this is how it happens but they actually give you those environments to practically make it possible like do it for yourself like we have that zone where you're not uh, using any public data it's just a safe space where you can you know do those things right right yeah i have many such incidences 
uh, at Hopkins where we were allowed to do such things and even encouraged to do that. So I definitely agree with you. That's perfect. And I guess on this lens, uh, we've not had so far any conversation with any guests like about the curriculum because this is pretty much really an expanded uh, curriculum where you have the theoretical plus the practical knowledge and obviously you can hop on hop off on different areas and understand what it is and you know get idea of it so i, I am totally like sold like right. if i were you i would have gone for it totally so great decision okay so so far i've gone through um the curriculum the university and everything so let's come to the point of let's talk money so mm -hmm. that's like the basic thing when we apply there are lots and lots of factors that everyone puts in in terms of finances that how we want to choose this particular university so uh, we don't want to get into the exact numbers but we generally want to understand like how much something gets out of pocket when one has to go to Hopkins and also the second part would be majorly to talk about are there any sort of scholarships that the university provides or you you still have to apply it on your own or is it merit based uh so we want to understand how was your process at your time and then obviously the finances how much um is expected out of pockets right uh so for our course the i20 requirements were if i remember correctly around eighty thousand dollars for the i20 requirements and the actual costs were somewhere close to that. It kind of depends on how you space out your subjects. Uh, if you're a full-time student or a part-time student, uh, if you're a full-time student, then it's a flat, I think $30,000 per semester. And then if you're a part-time student, it depends on the number of credits that you're taking. So uh, uh, if you're coming to Hopkins, then trying to plan that in the best way possible so that you maximize the number of courses that you're taking in your full-time semesters while also not overburdening yourself. Uh, that's that's a key. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the strategy I followed when uh, selecting uh, subjects later. Uh, but talking about scholarships, I'm not aware, like there are definitely scholarships at Hopkins. Uh, from what I saw, a lot of those were mainly for US citizens uh, because uh, I think Department of Defense uh, has some scholarship programs that are running even Hopkins themselves too. Uh, but mostly when it comes to international students, me personally, or I don't even know anyone else who received any sort of scholarship okay. from Hopkins. So uh, that's one thing. But the other uh, other side of this is also uh, uh, one thing that I touched upon earlier is that the batch size is small. So the research opportunities uh, that you have here are relatively huge. So uh, almost everyone in my batch, uh, me including, were able to land an RA role in the first few months or definitely by the second semester. Uh, there are also some on-campus jobs that are available. But uh, doing RA would definitely, if you are able to get an RA, that would definitely be a more useful uh, use of your time. Uh, and it paid enough that it took care of my general living expense so that the only thing I actually had to pay out of pocket were was the tuition fees. Got it. That that that's good. Like I I am I'm sorry I did not add up more about the you know, uh, what you talk about the research assistant and those kind of situation because if not scholarship, uh, those things actually help students in terms of like the day to day rent and other things. Uh, because the only bigger chunk is the tuition fees. Right. So, right. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, and in terms of like when we talk about your application, like when you submitted it to Hopkins, mm -hmm. uh, I know it's it's pretty like a flashback memory, but mm -hmm. anything like we know that one has to send LORs, one has to send the SOP, and you know, those are the common things, but 
apart from that did hopkins ask for anything you know different like in terms of like a video interview or an essay like a separate essay from sop right. or maybe like the test scores anything of that sort um if you don't remember that's also fine that that's totally good yeah uh, no uh, i just don't remember whether chiari was required at that time or not mm -hmm. uh, the english scores were definitely required okay uh, they had suggested us to go through some third party for a uh, conversion of our indian exam scores to something that okay. uh, to a us format i don't know what the uh what that third party was but i didn't do that i just sent my transcripts before that i had asked them on email uh mm -hmm. asking whether it's required or just recommended and they said it's just recommended but you can send in your okay. regular official transcripts so i just did that uh, apart from that i think hopkins also required us to send uh, so we had to give our sops and lors correct but hopkins also required us to send one video essay okay. uh, talking about the same thing why we want to join hopkins and mm -hmm. how good uh, as in our career so okay. yeah those pretty standard stuff just these one or two extra things that were required yeah because the the question that i like my my motive of asking this question was because you mentioned like your class strength was smaller yeah. so obviously they're trying to like trim down on people so there mm -hmm. has to be something that they're trimming it down so maybe the video uh mm -hmm. the thing helps them to actually filter out people that you know who they want right. to that's that's definitely possible yeah <laughs> Okay, so when is your like the program usually starts? Is it like always a fall start or like it starts in other uh you know uh, times as well? Or it's like a strictly fall course or it starts in spring or summer as well? No, uh, it starts in cake wise. It starts both in fall and spring. Okay. Uh, from what I saw, most people do join in fall. Okay. But it uh here it doesn't really matter. Like you can start in spring as well. Okay. Okay, great. So you said you wanted to talk about choosing the subject. So do you want to like talk about uh, it? Just mention, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so when we spoke about fall or spring, mm -hmm. uh, I think one benefit of going for fall is so some subjects are only available in fall, some are only available in spring, and some are available throughout. So the choices that you have are more. when you uh, are more in the fall semesters so generally here at hopkins people finish their courses in three semesters uh maximum four uh but most of the people i know they finish it in three semesters mainly because of the costs that are involved so what i personally did was so for completing a degree you need to complete 10 uh courses uh, i think it was 40 credits or 30 credits i'm not sure about the number of credits but it translated to 10 courses as well as a uh, a project a final a uh, final project that you had to do so for me what i did was in the first semester i took five subjects uh in the it's a lot of uh, it yeah so the reason i did that was okay so even when it comes to selecting these subjects uh what i did was and what a lot of people do is i selected more uh so i i, I think i selected four technical subjects and one management subject so generally the workload for the management subject is a little bit on the lower end so uh it let's say it's like a four and a half subjects and i had a ra alongside that so most people do four subjects and then in the next semester they do five uh, five subjects i did it the opposite way around uh in my second semester i took again i took four subjects as well as i tried to complete my capstone uh, so i completed my capstone project in the second semester itself the reason for doing this and in the final semester i just took one management subject so the reason for me personally to do this is like i had mentioned one was cost so if you are taking anything more than two subjects so three four five 
subjects you end up paying the same so i wanted to maximize the number of subjects i had completed in the first two semester uh you don't need to do that you can also do 442 four, uh that also works so in the second semester i wanted to get done with my capstone so that i had like one full semester where i could do either like a internship alongside my uh classes and i could also focus a bit on looking for jobs so that was the reason i aggressively tried to keep my last semester as light as possible obviously so, and you know job yeah. search as well yeah yeah so it definitely worked uh it was a bit hectic mm. uh did all these uh courses but again uh we do have a good amount of time like if you want to drop a subject you have i think a month or two months since your program starts uh if you feel you are over exerting and you want to drop any subject and then take it up later so uh like it was a safe bet to go with that and because of this like in my final semester i was able to just continue the internship i was doing over the summer i was able to continue that into a part time internship in my final semester as well so that gave me a good amount of like continuity and experience and then i was just able to after graduation i was able to just convert that into the full time job and obviously you had a great summer with your internship and then converting yeah. because you had not much of the subjects to do it was more right. of a interning time and learning and you know putting yeah, everything definitely. what you've learned yeah. so i didn't really have to think much about my capstone project because it was already done correct uh, so this was the way i did it uh it's definitely a bit more hectic towards the beginning uh but you can also do like you can maybe start with this but if you feel that it's becoming too much you can maybe drop a subject and do four four and two okay uh, which is what a lot of people do i guess it's a fair idea i think so when you come here um you're here for the studies so it's better you take more load and get things done early had it been i would have been at your place i would have done the same maybe like taking up maximum subjects at the starting so that the last semester i am like pretty much open with the current job scenario and everything because rather than chilling around in the first semester that would really become hard to actually put yourself out for second and the last semester because you know uh, your chill period would have made you so lazy uh that it would be difficult to you know take maximum subjects in the next two semesters so it's better like start being tough on yourself from day one like to take maximum and then maybe relaxing at the last semester like what you did right and uh, i mean it's also a bit about strategizing yeah. uh, uh so for example for me uh, so if you end up taking too many subjects but then you're not able to do good in any of them then to it's you have to make problem. a balance i guess the yeah. four subject should be in a way that you know at least you are able yeah. to manage so, yeah so for me for example uh, i had talked to a lot of seniors before deciding which subjects to take when so uh, let's say in the five subjects that i took in the first semester one was a management subject crm so i looked at its curriculum it was it seemed similar to the work i had done already at ey so i thought it would be relatively easy it wouldn't take a lot of effort so that was one subject down the second subject was space systems cyber security this again was uh so the same professor uh, at whose lab i was working he was the one who was teaching this so whatever work i was doing in the lab it was almost like the same thing was being taught again in the course uh, there were a few extras but the effort required there as well wasn't that much so there are two subjects down so now in reality i only had like three subjects where i had to actually dedicate a lot of time and effort uh to study so that made it easy and in the second semester as well i think i took up ethical hacking uh which was something i was i used to do bug bounties a lot in the past uh bug bounties and even penetration testing so i figured that subject would be relatively easy for me to do so there was a bit less pressure 
for that as well as there was systems security that was also relatively easier so and again one management subject again in that semester which was relatively chill so then in that semester i was able to focus more on my capstone and two actual technical subjects so uh, for me i actually had planned exactly which subjects i would take in each semester before i had even started my first semester and i had done all of this with like talking to class uh, talking to seniors uh, about how the professors are how much is the assignment load how how is the subject are there things that you can do beforehand which makes it easier for you during during the classes itself so all all those sort of things just i think helped me optimize my approach if i have to use those words i can't hear you oh sorry sorry uh, so it's it's basically we're talking more in the computer language of you know you know optimizing strategizing so but yeah that that's like a fair strategy and i am totally like siding it and i guess everyone hearing it right now may have gotten a good idea that you know if you have to take 10 subjects and somehow be quicker on that side strategize it better connect with your alumni and obviously listening here as well would help that you know, somehow you have to balance it, balance it right. out. Sorry. So great. Uh, we talked about a uh, in depth about you know subjects, choosing curriculum, uh, finances, scholarship, and you know the assistantship and other things as well. Um, just wanted to like uh go to the next step before you know we talk more about things when you came to United States. It's the you know the elephant in the room that's you know how how was your visa experience at with for you um how did it go was it like a easy breezy thing a smooth transition smoothly got your visa or was it like a you know took you months to you know capture and capture an appointment and then go there and get things sorted for you so uh how, how was your experience with the visa i'm trying to remember it but I think honestly for me it went pretty smooth. That's so, why you you were not able to remember anything because yeah, it... <laughs> I think it was pretty smooth. I was a part of a few uh, WhatsApp groups where people used to post if any visa slots were available. Mm -hmm. So before booking the slots, that was the only thing I really had to constantly monitor. And then after that, it was just about finding the slot. I was able to find a slot in Mumbai itself. Mm -hmm. And the visa interview was also pretty straightforward. I think I was just asked one or two questions. Like, I think uh, the interview just saw my I-20. He's like, oh, Johns Hopkins, Maryland. And I'm like, yes, Maryland. <laughs> and uh, That's, I think, all I remember from the interview. Uh, it maybe got over in 10, 15 seconds. So there was not a lot there. So, yeah, for me personally, it was a very seamless experience. Great, great. That's great because we've had like I've had really bad experiences with visa appointments and everything. Yeah, I've heard. Um, it was pretty chaotic. Like my flights were booked, but a week before I had my visa interview, so I was just manifesting it to the core that I have to get it approved. Like everything is all set. It's just this interview. Like mm -hmm. resigning from the job, booking flights. The orientation is on head for the college and you're still interviewing for the visa. Mm -hmm. So that was like a panic point or time, but eventually things happened good. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, it was really difficult to find a slot. I found it first in Bombay, but then eventually I rescheduled it back to Delhi because I got one and I did not have to travel that far because Delhi being the nearest yeah. place. But yeah, it was really a circus at that time. I, I must tell you, it was really bad. Oh my God, like another I level. Have, of... I've heard horror stories of people who had to go to I'm one of them. countries <laughs> to uh, get visa interviews. So yeah, I was definitely one of the lucky ones. But that's great. That's great. Not everyone should go through the same experiences. But yeah, we talked about a lot about before coming to US. Just giving you a moment here, how was like once you landed in Maryland and moved to your, obviously, uh, the place that you had planned before, how was the first few days or the first few weeks uh, transitioning uh, to a new country? 
Sure, I think for me, uh, on landing itself, if we are talking about that, two biggest things were one, I think we reached Baltimore at around eight, and it was still sunny. So that was pretty <laughs> weird for someone coming from Mumbai. Yeah. That uh, like sun was up in the sky at eight, and at that time it felt like there was literally no one on the road. Like all the roads were empty. So uh it was really silent. Like I was not used to that much of, of the silence in the beginning. Uh, but now it definitely feels very pleasant. Yes, now when you go back to India, you just hear more. It feels like you hear more like about all of this earlier. Uh but yeah, in terms of differences when coming to the US. Those are two main things that I can remember. Apart from that, personally for me, uh, and I mean, I would recommend this to anyone else also, if possible for you to do, is uh, so few small things were uh, when coming here, we had reordered our mattresses and oh. like, Wi-Fi because we reached here late at night and first day itself we had our house where we were supposed to stay. A lot of people get a hotel and then it's a non-issue. But if you are coming directly to your apartment and having those two things are definitely helpful. For me, uh, one of my friends who was who had come to the US earlier, uh, a year before me, he had come to help us set up. So that definitely made it a lot easier for us. So if possible for anyone, uh, that's something I would def definitely recommend. Uh, if you can have a friend come in and help you. And if not a friend, then maybe some senior from the university whom you talk to, if anyone is uh, willing to do that. That smoothed out a lot of the initial hurdles for us. The biggest thing being here, you need cars to go anywhere. And uh, uh, most of us are coming. We are coming from driving on the left side of the road to the right side. So it's not something you can do on day one. So having someone to show you around uh, about the US in general. So getting our SIM cards, getting our bank accounts, showing us where to get groceries, Indian groceries, what are the good brands, what is cheap what is expensive like if you go on day one to walmart and you see like milk for three dollars initially you'll convert everything to rupees and everything will look expensive so you won't have a frame of reference so just having someone in the initial few days to help you set up that's like i was really lucky that i had a friend to help me with that but if that's not the case then you can definitely join the like all colleges have groups for new students mm -hmm. uh, where there are some seniors. So you can join those and you can ask as many questions as you want there. Or you can, as I said, if you have some senior with whom you talk to or someone who is local to the area and just having them show you around uh, things about the US in the initial few days is definitely helpful. Yeah. And then after that, uh, you'll you'll easily get settled in you know yeah you have to actually and I remember like my university had this thing that uh they started up this volunteering program to pick up uh the students like the incoming mm -hmm. students from the airport like give them a ride to their uh, places and I really loved that because uh the airport from my place back in Atlanta was pretty far and Atlanta is famous for, you know, a lot of traffics and other things. And same as you, I had the same experience. Like I landed at seven and technically six, six thirty. And six, six thirty is that time in India when, you know, the sun is almost at the verge of like, you know, just hiding itself. But it just felt like, you know, it's fully up, like yeah, it was scaring me a lot. But then I thought maybe my times haven't changed. It's somewhere else's time that I'm able mm. to see. And that's why I see, you know, sun and everything. It's it's still like three or four o'clock in the afternoon. But eventually I got hold. Like that was the biggest thing. Like, you know, sitting in the balcony for hours and then realizing, oh my God, it's 8.45 in the night. Yeah. I have to make dinner and eat dinner. Mm. So, you know, that took us, took me some time. 
And then since I reached late, um, I had a lot of help from folks in terms of like bank appointments, grocery shopping. And I would totally agree. Like, you know, I, I did not even understand the difference between a lot of, you know, uh, tomatoes and, you know, different types of them. And I was like, which one are we buying? Yeah, like there are just so one? many options here. Yeah. You milk, you have like whole milk, 2% milk. Then you have all these non-dairy options. Correct. Like I was really lost for a moment that which, like, which one should I buy? And in my head, I'm already like converting everything like $3, $4, $1, $0.99 cents and everything of that sort. And yeah, it took me ages to actually understand what is like quarter, what is like dime mm -hmm. and other things. So yeah, it's always like a mixed feeling. But then we eventually sustained here, loved here. And now we know everything to what one day we were just thinking what to buy, what not to buy. So it's a long journey, but it was a great experience. And so was yours yeah. as well. Same for me. <laughs> it took you some time to settle up your room and, you know. Yeah, I, I am still doing that. <laughs> I'm still in the student mode. Okay. And yeah, uh, one thing that I, I think I, I didn't mention probably is... Uh, so I mentioned mattress uh, as an example, but you will find your local groups. There are a lot of groups local to your colleges where students are who have graduated, they're selling off their old things. And these people, if they're getting jobs elsewhere and they need to move quickly, mm -hmm. you'll often find a lot of things for extremely cheap. So that's how I, I like, I have bought, like most of the people here buy a lot of things. You don't just buy new off Amazon and that's a good way to save money. Yeah. Uh, you can just buy like a desk for super cheap desk, monitor, cupboards, any essentials. I still go through uh, Facebook marketplace a lot. Uh, uh -huh. Now that I live in like in a different uh, state and, you know, live alone, you know, student life was more of shareable spaces. Right. But uh, I still like go through marketplace because you see a lot of good things at cheaper price and that's like vintage or, you know, goes with the vibe of your room and or, or maybe like a necessity for you and you get those things. Yeah, so, definitely. That's the first place I look at. I guess that yeah, was one of the uh, thing that I learned from US as well. Like uh, I, I, I remember it very correctly. My roommate came up and said there's like a sofa set, you know, that's there below in front of the apartment. Uh, let's just go and see how does it look. Do we want to keep it in our living room when we were students? And right. we had that, like, a couple of other people had, like, a television uh, just in the yeah. uh, side of the apartment and they just used it for the entirety of their student time. So yeah. that was also one other thing that I was like, who leaves these all items for free? I would have not left it. Like, yeah. they could put something and they were all free and you just have to bring them up to your place. Yeah, and, and you don't see a lot of these things in India. Like, right. there are definitely some second-hand marketplaces. Uh, the never free. Speaker. Yeah, but the extent of what some of the things you see in the US, it's not the same in India. And definitely, uh, people leave things yeah. on sites or in right. dead spaces in the building. And mm -hmm. it's free for everyone to use. So that's definitely a thing here. I've had my first vacuum like that. <laughs> back in uh, student time so yeah it's all i've gotten a lot of books like that like uh, oh, nice. a lot of open libraries okay. where people leave their books and you can take them read them and then keep your own books or whatever so i've built my li library like that nice 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 that's great like this is this is one thing that i was really amazed at but now i really love this part uh -huh. of what we have this give and take thing of no uh, like of all these commodities so i really love it at times i put it likewise drop it like just take it like uh, i don't want to charge anything so that's like the best part of living here you get amazing things at free price yeah, of free yes <laughs> great um so i know we've talked in lens about a lot of things and uh Pretty much the last segment is basically to talk about your current job experience and how does it aligns with your degree program that you did. So if you can shed some light, obviously 
talking about what is your position and company name, but you know how it aligns with your degree program and yeah. Yeah. Uh, so currently I'm working as an associate application security engineer at Pearson. So this is a role that continued from my internship. Uh, basically what I do every day, it, it's purely cyber security. Uh, my role is of two parts. One is doing penetration tests, uh, pe te penetration tests, sorry about that, of our applications. And second is doing vulnerability management. So then you, you'll have a lot of, when you're working in huge organizations, you'll see a lot of these SASD, DAST, SCA uh, tools. You'll see a lot of logging systems, you'll see Jira, uh, things like that. And you'll be working with a lot of different teams. So managing the vulnerabilities that these tools find and working with the teams and uh, like verifying those issues, helping them fix it, helping them retest uh, those things. Like basically I'm the point of contact uh, for anything security related for the teams I'm responsible for. So it's a pretty fun experience. It's uh, it's a good balance of purely technical. Like when you think of cybersecurity, you think of hacking. So there's a good balance of that in terms of penetration testing, as well as there's a lot of uh, the relatively non-technical things as well uh, that I mentioned about earlier that you learn in university, like things about following SLAs or uh, uh, just these disaster recovery programs or just incidents management. Uh, all of that is is a part of, of my job. Oh, great. That's amazing. And this was this was one of the subjects I assume as part of your curriculum as well. Maybe you explored. Uh, I wouldn't say it was just one subject, but it was filled throughout uh, and that was the same thing that you were interning with and then converted into full-time. Yes, my internship was a bit more focused on the penetration testing side of things. Mm -hmm. And I have gradually gotten more into the vulnerability management as well. Okay. So I think that would just come with time. In, That's, in amazing. That's amazing. And really nice. Like, um, it's been 10 months, like... Um, you know, of learning and obviously like uh, I really feel happy when somebody's internship gets converted into full time. Like oh. we now hear it pretty less as compared to how we used to hear it previously. But uh, that's amazing that, you know, things worked out. And I know because the job situation is pretty, you know, thin for a lot of people. But I'm really glad things worked out for you. And obviously you are really meritorious so things will be worked out for you so that's great that you're working with Pearson with a lot of experience um we come now to one more question I guess that's more on the fun side of things uh if you Arpit can give us a like overview like a quick thing of any sort of community experiences uh that you were part of as part of Hopkins mm -hmm. uh like any clubs any societies like apart from your busy schedule and the RA ship and the capstone project were there any activities societies clubs that you were part of with the university uh yeah there are definitely certain clubs certain societies like that in the university uh I personally wasn't a part of any like uh I would have loved to. I was pretty active in uh, such societies in my undergrads, uh, in my undergrad, uh, but I wasn't able to do that a lot here at Hopkins, which if I had to change something, it would be that. But yeah, Hopkins does have good, vibrant community. Uh, there are, uh, there is this tutorial project uh, where you are doing volunteering with uh, with kids like teaching them basic oh, math, nice. science there's that uh, there are certain sports that I don't know of anyone from masters who is on the sports team yeah, uh, yeah I guess uh, you people were the busy ones <laughs> I guess so. You have to get a lot done in, in a short time. I can actually agree. Like 10 subjects cannot allow actually anything apart from covering them. 
yeah but in terms of community events uh, like the uh, our college had this igsa which was indian graduate students association so that hosted a lot of events so uh, a lot of our festivals uh, we had diwali puja and navratri garba uh, and celebration of holi uh, uh, so that was pretty good like that gave a good sense of community there are a lot of things constantly happening on campus mm -hmm. there are uh, drama teams there are uh, debate organizations all of these are are a factor uh, like are a thing that's available here so if you if you are motivated if you have the time to do that yeah. i would definitely recommend that you should uh, look into those you should at least uh, mm -hmm. go for it see if you are able to give some time to it there are also a lot of uh like technical chapters here like uh you have visas is pretty active which is women in cyber security yeah, yeah it's yeah it's pretty active in our university there are a few more such organizations i i don't just remember i don't remember them at this point but there are a lot of mm -hmm. such organizations that that you can be a part of that's amazing like uh that's everything actually uh there it's just if you can you know make time like the college has a lot of things that's great mm -hmm. and arpit do you want to like shed some light on your college pronunciation like that i went wrong way then obviously you learned it as well on your orientation day so do you want to put it out on the podcast like what's the correct pronunciation so that nobody gets wrong with it mm -hmm. if by any means they are unintentionally yeah this is this is just a thing that a lot of people do i think almost everyone when reading the college name the first and they would do this mistake i did it i <laughs> you did it I did. Uh, so it's not john hopkins university it's johns hopkins okay. uh, and yeah we were told this on the first day of our orientation itself so yeah there's there's a stat that's great like a lot of things shared and this was you know i i am happy that you corrected me or else i would have gone wrong all through the video but that's amazing and that's a good learning for all of us obviously about the college curriculum and also about the college's name it sounds easy but somehow everyone just misses it so thanks for that and i wouldn't have minded that but people in your comment section definitely i know <laughs> yeah like people like full time lovers of johns hopkins yeah. they would have done it so thank you so much for saving me from that and one last thing before we wrap up is um as you know as part of the alumni section do you want to give out any you know uh, advice to the future incoming students as a senior uh, and as a graduate person from the university any advices that you have to give out to the future students um just like a few random pointers mm -hmm. uh at uh, in point out uh one is if you are inter if, if you are talking about cyber security uh if you are anyone who is interested even a little bit into things around the medical community uh then i don't think there's any better place than hopkins for that uh you will see that as a backdrop everywhere in all subjects anything that you do there is this strong presence of the medical industry uh so if that's you then this is the best place uh apart from that uh, you'll hear a lot about baltimore itself like baltimore being unsafe uh that is true to an extent but uh places around the campus they're very safe uh Uh, we have this campus security that's constantly doing the rounds. There is a perimeter set around campus, so if you're living inside that, then then it's going to be very safe. And even outside that, uh, there are just a few areas that you have to avoid that you'll know when you talk to seniors or when you come here. But uh, that was a thought for me before coming. But honestly, I wouldn't. Uh, think that you should worry about that like if that's a factor for you to choose between hopkins and any other university then it shouldn't be a factor uh 
you can talk to seniors you can message me uh, if you want to know like what areas are good what are areas you want to avoid uh, and yeah uh, talk to seniors people here are very helpful uh, both in terms of these subjects that you have to take the places where you can get stuff uh, apartments anything anything that has to do with coming to the us and yeah i mean i mean that that would be pretty much it thank you so much arpit and uh, we'll have your linkedin handle in the description below so if anyone wants to ask more follow up questions anything more that we couldn't discuss here or you want to have more one on one discussion so we'll have his linkedin handle and you can totally connect with him and ask more questions if any obviously uh, related to your degree program or any specific questions but um this was really great to talk about a lot of things arpit and thank you so much for taking out time and uh, coming here talking about your experiences i know we discussed in lens about a lot of things and if somebody is coming up for this course it would be really really fruitful like i can say it if i was to come and choose for the cyber program this particular discussion the things that you talked about would really have helped me uh you know in actually like just just choosing that course and the uh, college so thank you so much for taking out time and i hope so people take advantage of it and ask more questions and there could be more brilliant mind coming to johns hopkins so thank you so much for sparing time and coming on itsp magazine you no know, thanks a lot for having me here uh, it was similar podcasts and similar videos that helped me mm-hmm. as well when i was coming here so i'm just happy to kind of paid forward so thank you uh, and yeah definitely feel free to message me on linkedin uh, if you want to discuss anything about hopkins great thank you so much and to everyone we'll be back with another episode soon and happy holidays to everyone and thank you so much arpit bye bye bye